Welcome to ELT Live, start of the semester university edition, being streamed live on August 28th. Uh, this is Jeff Lebo in Pusan, Korea, and I've been wanting to get some English language teaching webcasting going for quite a while, and uh, I scurried at the last minute to gather some people together because the semester here in Korea starts uh, in a few days, and I thought we'd uh, spend some time talking about our approach to beginning semesters, what's on our plate uh, this particular semester, and anything else that is on our minds. Uh, first, let's introduce ourselves. Uh, again, I am Jeff Lebo. I teach at the Uni Pusan University of Foreign Studies. And if you all can just go around, we'll start with Daniel and work our way right, if you can introduce yourselves. Hi, my name is Dan Craig. I'm, uh, I teach at uh, Sangmyung University in Seoul. And currently, I'm joining you from my new place in in the suburbs of Seoul and Paju. I'm way out in the boonies at this point. So nice to meet you all. And Lauren? I am Lauren Harvey. I'm also at Busan University of Foreign Studies. And Sunny. OK, hi. I'm Sunny. I am now. Uh, jobless, <laughs> but I'm a, a PhD candidate and I'm studying in a Seoul National University at the moment. <laughs> nice to meet you all. And I should also mention former colleague of mine uh, at Pusan University of Foreign Studies. Yes. Uh, so I want to talk about how we approach the beginning of semesters, but first since we have 24 hours of vacation left, I'm just wondering if anyone has had any special professional development experiences, any special getting your batteries charged, have you read any articles, come across some new tools that you said, oh, I can't wait for the semester to begin to use that, or not? Have you thought, oh my god, <laughs> it's so nice <laughs> not being in the classroom? And anyone jump in if you have anything to share. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I, I'll jump in. Uh, one of the things I started with last semester, a few things I've started with uh, that, that I'm kind of uh, refining and, and implementing again this year. Um, first of all, I'm trying to flip a writing class. And I, I'm kind of excited to get back to that and apply what I learned last semester from doing so. And also, I, I, I shifted uh, my writing classes to Google Docs and uh, started integrating more Google stuff. Uh, into those classes, and so I, I'm, I'm kind of looking forward to that, even though it's a little bit of a challenge. Mm -hmm. Good to hear from you, because now I'm working on a flipped classroom project with the KBS Broadcast Company. So I've, I'm I'm just beginning to work with um, uh, middle school um, students. So we are doing uh, four classes of uh, flipped classroom in English subject plus uh, math. So I don't know how it's going to turn out, but um, I'm kind of into flipped classroom. So I'm glad to hear from you that you're starting. Or um, it's a second trier, you said? Yeah, I began last semester, and I, I'm, I'm starting to write up that experience. But uh, um, mm -hmm. this semester, I'm trying to kind of you know, uh, apply what I learned from that. Um, uh -huh. Of course, the, the number one takeaway is don't talk so much. <laughs> so have you made uh, any video? like? for your lecture? So students uh, watch that before your lecture then? Yeah, I experimented with a few different kinds of uh, video. Um, uh, something that was more of a screencast uh, of a presentation. I did some that had uh, uh, like a webcam video in addition to presentation. I haven't actually tried something at the board, which I'd kind of like to do as well. Mm -hmm. uh, but so far, surprisingly, the students actually like to see my face. Mm -hmm. I, I'm not exactly sure why. <laughs> what do you mean I, I, do something at the board? Uh, well, you know, if you've ever seen a lot of the, the Korean online uh, lectures, um, most of them are done on a blackboard. That's kind of a, a, almost an expected um, manner of doing so. It's, and I, I'd kind of like to give that a try and see how the students like it as well. So standing um, at a physical blackboard or whiteboard as if you were in a traditional classroom. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And so uh, that, that's challenging, though, because actually that's just much more difficult to record. The sound is much more difficult. So it's, uh, um, I, I haven't done it yet, but I, I think I'll try it this semester and see how they like it. Mm -hmm. okay. All right. Um, 
so let's get into to, and I, I want to get back to a lot of that stuff uh, because it's overlapping on what some of my projects this semester. Um, but I would love to first of all hear what what are we teaching? And I, I should mention that this particular webcast, mm -hmm. I've invited people in Korea who are teaching university level. Um, I love to facilitate other conversations for different levels, cross places. But I thought for a, a pilot episode, we'd kind of narrow the focus a little bit. Um, and just to provide a little background of what we're teaching this semester, I am I do teacher training, but I'm also teaching a uh, graduate course in storytelling and a undergraduate kind of upper level conversation where I have some freedom to kind of do what I want. So I'm, I'm looking forward to experimenting with a lot of Google tools there as well. Um, just quickly, let's go around and, and share what we're teaching. Uh, well, I, I have a, a decent mix this year. Uh, I'm teaching a computer-assisted language learning class. So that's always one that I enjoy uh, doing. Um, and of course, there'll be more of a survey of available technologies and how to go about using those in the classroom. Um, I teach a, I teach a lot of different writing classes this semester. I'm teaching a, a graduate and an undergraduate writing class, and a uh, and then I have I have a methods class this semester, and a uh, um, oh, and then I'm teaching a listening class as well. Okay, and I'm teaching English conversation for second year students, and the same advanced uh, conversation course that Jeff is also teaching. And then I have two courses of composition for second year students. And then I'm doing a teacher training class on techniques and approaches uh, for teacher training. OK. Um, as I mentioned, at the moment, I'm a jobless. So I'm in the university, but I don't teach any of class, but I assist. Uh, my professor uh, teaching uh, one of the courses in undergraduate program. It's a teaching method, how to teach English in Korean um, K-12 education program. Okay. So. And you're digging deeper into all sorts of interesting uh, areas like um, uh, flipped classrooms and self-directed learning and whatnot. Um, so yes. the question is, Monday morning, first, first day of classes for us, most of us here in Korea, what we've all been teaching for a number of years. What? How do you approach the first day? What do you do? How do you enter the classroom? How do you spend that first hour? And what are your your goals and methods for the first week? Share the wisdom. <laughs> if it's a big class, I scare them, <laughs> so I can make it a small class. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, in, in reality, I go in and I. Uh, um, it's my desire to to be. I don't know what to say. Closer to the students, uh, or uh, just uh, approachable, and so I try to provide a lot of information about myself and get a lot of information about them. Uh, so doing, I we do some kinds of um, uh, introduction activities, of course. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, one that I enjoy doing is, especially with the classes that haven't met me before and probably don't know anything about me, is I like to have them guess about me. And so I just get them together in groups, and they just have to make a story about me without knowing anything about me beforehand. And, and that's fun. I like those kind of introductory activities, too. Usually I do some kind of a find someone who, I'm sure you guys have done that with different topics, you know, find someone who likes to cook, find someone who has more than two siblings, things like that, and give them a chance to kind of circulate and talk to multiple students so they can learn about each other and then we kind of go through a whole group debrief and they can find out about their classmates. So I like that one. I also like to do um, two truths and one lie so they can share three things about themselves two of which are true and one of which is a lie, and they have to uh, let their classmates guess which which one is the lie, and then they can kind of learn a little bit more about each other. So I like those kinds of icebreakers where they can get to know each other a little bit, and it's very low stress, just kind of getting to know you that first week um, before jumping into classroom expectations for behavior and 
assignments and things like that. So um, I think starting with icebreakers is good, and then I always go into kind of a co-created list of expectations, and I usually do that through kind of a think-pair-share where they can think about some ideas um, about what they expect from the class, not in terms of rules or assignments, um, but how they'll behave, how they'll act, to kind of get them thinking about um, active participation. So uh, I usually do it in a think-pair-share kind of format. How do you structure that? Like, do you give them a, some kind of graphic organizer with questions on it? Are they in pair? Yeah, yeah. I have usually two questions kind of what, under the big umbrella of expectations. What do you expect to do in this class? Um, but not in terms of we will learn grammar or we will improve vocabulary, but how will we be and how will we behave to kind of get them um, thinking about being actively uh, participating in class. So I give them some questions to think about and then go through a think-pair-share and then kind of make a list for that class and um, then I can come back to it, you know, the following week and, you know, go through the list and say, you know, are we sharing opinions? Are we... Um, working together well in groups, things like that. Do you generally get what you want from that? Or, I mean, do you have something that you do want from that? Do you get what yeah. you want? And if you don't, what do you do? Yeah, I usually can get enough of it, and then there may be a few extraneous things um, that I can kind of then add to it, kind of give my own a few additional things if they haven't gotten everything. So usually it works pretty well. Um, and it's something that I can come back to later and kind of remind them of to see how we're doing. So I think the bottom line in a lot, lot of the classes we teach is that participation usually is kind of the difference between an A and a B. And as long as you've set that expectation up front and they kind of know that if they just sit quietly and don't really do anything other than turn in the assignments, they're not going to get the A. So for me, I think the whole idea of prepping them for working in groups, even in a writing class or a conversation class, is good to do it up front because then they know that there is, you know, a score tied to whether or not they participate. So for me, that's kind of the big underlying reason for doing it. Yeah, and for me, week one is generally about letting them know how I teach and what this course is going to be like. I go through some very basic, this is what you can expect, this is what, you know, I expect, uh, and I'll talk more about all the details next week. Because the other thing that happens is the drop ad. You know, I kind of want the students who aren't going to succeed in my class or aren't going to be happy, I want them to experience it as quickly as possible so they can flee. And yeah. I, the ones who are like, oh yeah, this is my kind of course, tell their friends and they can come. And so yeah. my first class activity that I've just fallen in love with is an acquaintance jigsaw. And so, how, you know, we'll have 15 students or 20 students, and I'll do uh, four groups of five or four groups of four, and they sit in that group, and they have five minutes to interview that person talk show style and find out as much as they can about that person. And they go around, and they have to take notes, and then we jigsaw. And then in the next group, they have to tell their new group members about the people they just met. And so in that way, everyone has either met or heard about everybody in the class. And I have found, especially in Korea, the the social connections are really important. And if there isn't sort of a, okay, I know these people comfort level, then a lot of the activities are much harder. So I try to establish that. And I also try to give them a feel. That's what my classes are going to involve a lot of small group discussions and yeah. and and that. So yeah. it, it's generally successful socially and also gives them a sense for what to expect. Okay. So how do you organize the grouping? Like what kind of grouping strategy do you use to get them into the smaller group? A1, A2, A3, A4, B1, B2. All right, A's, whoosh, B's, whoosh, and <laughs> off they go. Yeah, I like that too. Count off by four, all the ones together, all the twos together. Yeah. And I always tell them, remember your number because I'm not going to remember your number. Right. Mm -hmm. Sunny, I know you're not actively in the classroom now, but did you have uh -huh. any... Uh, and also, because you can also approach this from, as a, you were once a Korean student. Uh, uh. Did you have any insights as former student or, you know, mm -hmm. yeah. professor? Yeah. 
like as as all mentioned today, like I'm using like most of activities um, for ice breaking because for the first week, you know, they are very um, quiet and then they don't seem to um, express who they are, and they are also uh, want to know they want to drop my course or stay in my course, right? So I want to give a good impression too. I mean, like I don't want to have a too many students, but I want to have a good students uh, working together and uh, create a positive atmosphere for the class as well. So uh, most of the time I'm doing the icebreaker, but as you know, Koreans, if they, I don't know, like myself too, you know, like if they don't give a um, um, very um, detailed instruction, they kind of hesitate to express themselves. So as Lauren mentioned, I love that activity, two truths and one lie. Like when I use that activity, people just jump into uh, the conversation and they are so excited to find out what's lie. So I, I love that activity. Um, that's what I have done so far. And oh, the other activity I really like is choosing three adjectives representing them their characteristics. Mm -hmm. So that way I can involve the linguistic feature of, you know, my course, which is English conversation, so they can look up the good adjectives to describe themselves and then they mm -hmm. can also introduce in a very uh, constructive way as well. So uh, yeah, that that that's my favorite ice breaking activity. And then at the same time, <laughs> uh, grouping is another issue actually in Korea. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm using the same way as a Jeff did and Lauren did like one, two, okay. three, four, and <laughs> remember your yeah. number. Or I'm doing the raffle thing. So I make a number, one, two, yeah. 24, something like that. So they come in front and I pick the number and it's automatically okay. one, two, three, four as a one group and then five, two, eight becomes a yeah. okay. number. So that's how I Like do. the first couple of weeks I tend to just do it based on random picking or some kind of yeah. raffle, but then they tend to always sit in the same seats and it can wind up being almost the same groups, so sometimes exactly. I'll change how I do it and then I'll okay. start mixing it up with like month you were born, January, February, yeah. March here, and then I'll do it by blood type. <laughs> and I'll know their blood type and they find that very interesting. So yeah. kind of grouping is yeah. interesting. Yeah, I, there's so many ways. Sometimes I've done groups on like, okay, four people are wearing blue, you're working together. Four people wearing white, you're working together. So sometimes, you know, if it's just a random grouping, there's so many ways you can do it. I've also brought candy on the first day and uh, kind of color-coded by the wrapper, like, you know, find another person that has a green wrapper or an orange wrapper and your partners. So I've done it that way too. So in the beginning when it doesn't matter as much, you can do a lot of different random, you know, grouping strategies. And I tend to, like, the first couple of weeks are pretty social in my classes, and my, my last social activity is kind of, guess the classmate, where I'll give them a, a, a handout in five words that describe yourself, your favorite food, favorite color, something people don't know about you, whatever, and they fold it up and then they group and they get one and they have to guess who it is. Uh, I learned long ago that the secret to web building and teaching is narcissism. People really <laughs> <laughs> enjoy talking about themselves. Uh, Daniel, I'm, I'm sure you have stuff to chime in and you've also been uh, tuning into the chat room. If you have anything to convey from there, please do as well. I, I, I will do. I, I'm just listening. I, I, I've done a lot of these uh, grouping activities uh, as well in similar ways. It always depends on what the class is, what their makeup is, what the topic is. You know, I have some classes that are mixed majors. In those classes, it, you, it often works pretty well either to purposely group them as majors or purposely not uh, group them into majors. Um, uh, group in the majors, if we're talking about maybe career-oriented things or, or a job or knowledge base. Uh, but of course, I also like to uh, split them up if, if we're just going to be social because they have to learn to talk to other people. And let's face it, oftentimes the engineers don't really speak very well to anybody, much less the other engineers. Um, as far as other grouping activities, um, you know, it, it, again, it depends on what's going on. Uh, I might just do pairs. I'll probably just have people who are sitting together normally. Um, if I'm going to do more uh, graded activities, I'll randomly assign them usually. Uh, not always, though. I've, I've experimented with a little bit of both. You know, I, I've had them pick their own groups and me pick groups for them. Overall, it seems to be better when I pick the groups. 
because then, you know, if someone's slacking, they let me know. Um, Lauren, you mentioned kind of the development of, of policies and rules is such an outdated word, but rules. Expectations. <laughs> Expectations, right. <laughs> I'm sorry, I knew there was a 21st century word for that. Uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm curious to hear how other people develop those, present those, enforce those. So please share them. <laughs> what you <do> <laughs> I, I have really strict rules, but I, I, I often bend quite a bit. Um, so things like uh, late assignments. Uh, on my syllabus, I say that it's, uh, I, I subtract 10% per day uh, mm -hmm. for, for a late assignment. And in reality, it's probably more like, I'll do 10% if you're a week late. <laughs> <laughs> So, but but I'd never tell them that until <laughs> until it's time. Um, uh, other things, uh, but I'm pretty strict with things like attendance, um, participation. Actually, uh, one of the things I tell students the first day of class is I don't care if you sleep in my class. Um, if I'm talking, I don't really care if you're doing anything that doesn't really interrupt me. But if you're doing group work. Uh, you, you can't be doing anything other than the group work. And so if I catch them doing, uh, you know, a talk or something like that during group work time, I, I'll, I'll, I'll bust them some points. You really don't care if they sleep in your class? Honestly, I don't. You know, listen, I, I get tired too. I mean, I don't get enough sleep, but sometimes it's hard to stay awake in a class. I know that. <laughs> I mean, I'm a sleeper. <laughs> and, uh, and the reality is, if I'm not doing enough to keep them awake, they deserve to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> well, and I think the reality, too, is that, you know, in our case, anyway, you need to have 30% at the bottom who get a low score. So if somebody wants to sleep, they're putting themselves into that category for me. Speaking of which, at our university, we have pretty strict grade quotas, and 30% is it 30 or 30% 30 get Cs or C pluses, and 35% get Bs or B pluses. Mm -hmm. um, and so I have gotten much more explicit about grading. And this is what's going to cost you. Uh, and I learned to like give a midterm assessment. This is this is, this is what you got so far. Um, yeah. Because and it breaks my heart sometimes because people do not deserve those C's or C pluses. So I definitely am explicit about that. Um, and like I was reading a post on Facebook today, ten things professors wish you knew or something. And one of them really hit home that I never have addressed before, and it's getting up or like straightening your books as I'm finishing class. That drives me nuts when we're done with the activity and I want a minute or two to consolidate, to finalize, to do a final tada of some kind and they're, they're flutzing around. So I'm going to add that to my policies this semester. <laughs> I, I just, when they do that in my class, I keep them late. <laughs> <laughs> I did, I, I'll just wait until they stop fidgeting around and be like, you guys ready to go? Really? So what are you going to do today? <laughs> and I lean back a little bit and let him sweat. <laughs> Anything else on, on policies? First week stuff? In my case, as um, everybody already mentioned, like I put the very strict um, um, and clear um, discipline rules up front so that way students know what what are the things they must do it and what are the something that could have um, kind of choose to do it so that way um, they know how to manage this masters in my course and as a Daniel mentions I said no late um, submission of any of <laughs> Um, assignment because once I give us some rooms they tend to what is it uh, they tend to postpone it and and um, tend to see that the chance of um, doing it late so I just put that in up front no late assignment but there is a students you know always asking a remote um, chance late late in a semester so in that case I deal with an individual basis but um, I put a very strict rule up front. But I picked a lot of assignment because, as you mentioned, there is a 30% of people got to have a bottom. So I kind of uh, make uh, various types of assignments so that way pe everybody have a fair chance to do what they're good at. 
you know? So, like, five different or six different assignments throughout this semester, so that way they could have um, a formative way of, um, how can I say, of building their things, not just one type of assessment, uh, judging their uh, performance throughout the semester. So, and like, Nina makes a good point in the chat room about in writing, so they can't claim you never told them, which is especially in an L2 yeah. environment, Oh, I didn't know that. It's a, you know, it's important to share it in writing. And even beyond that, I'm wondering, like, do you do any kind of learner contract or anything like that, Lauren? In your, as, as you develop these expectations, is there any okay? I agree to these. Well, I just kind of presented it as this is something that we've created together. That everyone was a part of the discussion. So, um, you know, I may come back to it the following week and kind of review the list. Um, you know, as a PowerPoint slide, but no, no contract specifically. And I mean, I like that idea. I've never done it myself, but I don't think this. Yeah, semester. I did a presentation last year at the International TESOL Conference, and I have a handout about it. I can send it to you about kind of, you know, getting students ready for group work by developing those kinds of expectations. All right, we'll look forward to that. Uh, all right, so we've survived the first week or two of class. The new semester is here. What are we looking forward to? What projects are we going to work on? What methods are we going to try? What what are we going to play with this semester? Daniel, you had mentioned uh, more Google Docs and stuff. What else do you have in store? Yeah, so last uh, last semester I moved everything to Google Docs. I used um, uh, Doctopus to organize those assignments and send them out. And that worked out really well. I mean, uh, for, for years, I, I, I teach a lot of writing classes, and so I take in a lot of documents. And for years, I've just struggled with different formats of documents and different formatting in documents, and people didn't give me their names and so forth. You know, and It was just a real pain. Can you so, elaborate uh, on Doctopus a little bit? It's a Chrome yeah. add-on? And so uh, Doctopus is an, uh, now what's referred to as a... Uh, it was an add-on or whatever uh, in, uh, in Google Docs. Doctopus, um, what it allows you to do is you can plug in your roster. It will create a folder for each person. And then you can send assignments out, essentially, to the whole class or groups of people. So you can send out different assignments to different groups. And it will kind of organize that for you and set the permissions. And so uh, so in Google Docs, you know, you have to share a document with somebody. Well, how would you like to set, share, you know, go through and have to share documents with 50 people every assignment? You know, and so Doctopus takes care of that for you. Um, there's also something that goes along with Doctopus called Gubric. And Gubric is a, a rubric add-on that will allow you to kind of facilitate grading as well. And I, I think it's built into the newest uh, Doctopus. I don't know if you guys know, but last, um, last year, not even last year, probably six or seven months ago, uh, Google kind of made changes to the way those operated. And so they, they went from extensions to add-ons or add-ons to extensions. I kind of forget right now. And uh, when they did that, uh, Doctopus had a lot, uh, got a lot more features, and so uh, it's probably a standalone at this point. But it's, it's invaluable for anyone sending out assignments using uh, Google Docs. Um, you can turn them. You can also uh, uh, you can also change permissions all in one shot. And so you can say, you know, okay, editing time is done. Close it out, and they can only be readers from now on. Um, and so that's one way to stop late assignments, certainly. Um, so uh, there's a lot of different things that it can do. It's, it's a really great, it's a really great add-on. I, I have three follow-up questions already. Uh, one with the because I've used Google Docs for writing courses also and love them. And one of the things I liked the most is it was easy to share them with classmates, and so the, it made peer editing a lot easier. It made the sense of an audience more uh, real. Um, have you? Do you have students engage with other students' writings via Google Docs or anything? Well, one of the things I wanted to do, and which I also did last semester, was the the reason I wanted to flip the class is because I wanted to use more class for writing time and discussion. Um, so I had them do the editing mostly in class, uh, and so I did not last semester have them have them do editing of each other's papers in Google Docs. Um, I may do that in the future. 
but I still enjoy having them edit within class because then they can ask me questions and uh, I, I think overall I think they do much better editing when we're doing it that way. Mm -hmm. I kind of agree with Daniel as well. Like, um, it, they want, they might want to have some kind of privacy at later stage, like if, like a final draft thing. They want to show the professor and then want to get a feedback, like a one one to one basis. Because as Daniel mentioned, if they could get a interactive feedback in class, so for the final product, they want to see the more, prof I don't know more feedback from the teacher, so that way it'd be good. Yeah, so the way I operationalized it this semester is uh, it's a little clunky, but it worked out pretty well, which is, um, well, for the class that I was teaching, it was a class preparing uh, um, pre-service English education teachers for the teacher's exam. Mm. And so they were so uh, how did we start out here? So we started off mm -hmm. with uh, uh, timed writing in the classroom. And so they did the timed writing, and then they, uh, they took a picture of it mm -hmm. and uploaded it onto their Google Doc. <laughs> and then they brought it back the next class and had editing done on it, took a picture of that, and uploaded it to the Google Doc. Then they did their rewrite, uh, their, their rough draft, and they did that in the document itself. But they brought again. They brought another copy to the class and had it edited and so forth. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, in doing this, we ended up with a number of different pictures and some text and a weird mix on some assignments. Mm -hmm. uh, as I said, it worked out pretty well for us, though, and I, I'm I'm definitely going to do it that way again this semester because everyone's got a smartphone, and so everyone could just take a picture of their paper and put it on put it on the dock pretty easily. Mm -hmm. Um. Welcome back, Lauren. Hi. Uh, speaking of smartphones, one thing I do with all my classes here in Korea is form a group cacao chat. And for those outside of Korea, cacao is a, a omnipresent messaging uh, app that everybody has. Mm -hmm. And for me, it's been a great way to send homework reminders, to send out last-minute announcements, to build some social rapport. And sometimes I'll have two group chats. One kind of a, a business English only zone and one hang out, talk about what you're doing Friday night, whatever. Um, and that's been great. Um, <coughs> um, I want to follow up more with you, Dan, on, on what you're doing this semester, but I also wanted to ask Lauren a question from Nina in the chat room, and I think you're best suited to answer this. Are there expectations that American teachers have which Korean teachers do not have or vice versa? And how do you deal with this? Since you were teaching at an American university, what's yeah. the big difference? I think the biggest difference for me was just the expectation for active participation in class. And, you know, when you ask a question, that somebody is going to answer it. And so for me, I think that was the biggest difference is just kind of getting to know Korean students um, in terms of, you know, learning style and personality and what they're comfortable with. Um, but for me, participation is really important because that class time is when they can show you what they can do. So for me, just getting the students comfortable with participating and answering questions or working in groups, that was the biggest difference that um, I saw coming to Korea was just um, getting students comfortable with active participation in class. Yeah, I agree with the Lauren. Like questioning is the one of the toughest things for the Korean. Actually, it's not just the students, but uh, for the older people actually, because we are educated to be a bit listen to the teacher. Is a teacher-centered classroom is the most comfortable kind of education or context for us. So questioning seems to be a very difficult one. But all of a sudden, when they come to university in uh, English conversation class or um, native speakers class, we tend to expect bring the question and then discuss in the classroom, but they don't know what to ask. So that would be different expectations mm -hmm. between Korean professor and foreign professors. Um, Dan, I know you're being asked some questions in the chat. Do you want to answer them orally? We lost your video. 
Oh, did you lose me? Am I back on? You, we hear you. Oh, there you are. We hear you, Anthony. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, yeah, I, I was trying to type quickly, and I'll I'll, uh, I'll direct them to Nina because she's asking most of the questions here. Um, to, to reiterate, yes, I did use Doctopus. Uh, I I had great um, I had great uh, how shall I say? I, I don't really want to say I had great success, um, but it was in terms of a first iteration, it went, went really well. Um, the the biggest benefit for me is simply document management. Um, there are certainly others, though, as well. Um, when I use Doctopus, uh, I send out all the assignments, and so everyone has an assignment. They have the right assignment every time. Um, I even uh, this I structure the assignments and so that it's a uh, like an outline basically, and so each thing that they have to submit just gets added to that one assignment. Um, and so in that way, they can't say, oh, I didn't know I had to do that part because it's right there. Um, How much setup is there on their end? How, like, I assume they have to have a Gmail address. Uh, what about, do they need to use Chrome? Do they need to use Doctopus? They, the only setup that's involved for them is they need a, a Google account, a Gmail, of course. They need a Google account, and they need to tell me what it is. And then... I send the documents to them. They get a notification in their email when, when they get a new document, and uh, they, they go and edit. Have you taken Google Classroom out for a spin yet? Uh, yeah, I, I wish I had access, and I don't. Uh, though, someone just told me that I could get my, um, my Google uh, um, uh, business app account shifted to an education account, and if I do that, then I'm going to give it a try. Uh, what else is on your radar for call? This semester, what uh, what tools were especially successful in recent semesters, and and what's what where do you folk what has your attention this coming semester? Well, what's always most interesting to me is having students bring in the things that they're using, um, because uh, for for a number of different reasons. But the biggest one is most of them are on the Korean net, and I I don't have as much exposure to the Korean web as I do the English web. Um, and so you get a lot of different tools and applications. Um, I'm familiar with a lot of them, but but uh, there, there's always something new. One of the things I'm always surprised about a little bit is, is that uh, there's actually so little variety it, that my students bring in, at least. Um, and so whether it just doesn't exist or they just don't know about it, uh, it is, is a question. Some of the things that I'm going to introduce are just uh, kind of a, a survey of different types of technologies and suggestions for how to use them for different skill sets with different levels of learners. And who are you teaching call to? Uh, these are pre-service teachers. Okay. And what do they come away with saying, ooh, I'm going to use this in my class? I think it's primarily the thing that gets them the most are the different multimedia technologies and so creating uh, um, you know some type of web videos screencasts uh, websites um, you know it's, it's nothing too out of the ordinary really I mean uh, these are a lot of these things are just stuff they haven't done they haven't been on their radar I say for me the one that has gotten used the most is Quizlet uh, teachers will use that to create and it's it's gotten just better and better and it's so mobile friendly and it's it's a flashcard based thing yeah. but it's a lot of activities and I've used that in my all my courses actually I use a, like instead of writing I don't write anything on the board ever I use a Google Doc first thing yeah. I do I get into class I turn on the computer each class has and I can uh, share my screen here um, So here's my website for uh, my undergrad last semester. And so each court group has group notes. And so this is a Google Doc that is publicly editable. And so anytime someone asks a word or whatever, I toss it up on the Google Doc. And sometimes, sometimes I say, OK, go and add translations or commentary whenever you want to. Uh, other times, I'll assign it and say, OK, your homework this week, you're the, the Google Doc annotator. Um, and then I've also, and I experimented with this, not that successfully, transferring that over to a Quizlet. 
Uh, and so there's a quizlet for that cumulative vocabulary that we developed throughout the semester. And of course, once they have the quizlet, it's just so awesome when they're on the bus or on the subway on their way to school, they can, you know, practice their flashcards, they can take the scatter test, whatever they want. Um, so qu quizlet for, for uh, both the teacher's call and for my undergrads has been really useful. The thing last semester that really got their attention was Powtoon. Uh, you know, for a while, you know, everyone uses PowerPoint, and for a while, Prezi had the buzz. Mm -hmm. Powtoon is just, and sometimes for teachers, all they want is just sort of a different little presentation style, and Powtoon is kind of a, a, a different. Uh, but getting back to what we're working on this uh, semester, uh, let's, let's, Daniel, I'm sure you have more stuff that you're working on, but Lauren or Sunny, what's got your attention this semester? What are you working on? Um, my interest is always kind of looking at what the textbook offers in terms of the topics that it presents can be kind of limited, you know, they're not that interesting, they're kind of the same general topic that you always see in, in every textbook, so my interest is more in engaging the students to discuss social issues and more of a critical perspective, so I like to try to give them assignments where they can use more kind of higher order bloom skills and really analyze kind of the world around them. So last semester, for example, their final exam was write a cause and effect uh, paragraph, but I gave them topics that were socially relevant, like um, the Sewol uh, ferry sinking was the topic, and they had to um, incorporate what were the causes and what were the effects in that situation. So I'm always looking for ways to kind of add to what the textbook provides and give them opportunities to um, share their opinions and develop their ability to use English for a more critical social perspective. Can so you walk I'm me through that, that. that assignment workflow? So you have them write mm -hmm. something first and then what are the next right. steps? Right. So, for example, with the cause and effect, you know, we had a unit in the textbook that covered the paragraph structure, and it gave some kind of generic topics for cause and effect. Um, and then for discussion, I gave them some additional topics for cause and effect. And then for their final exam, I used that same paragraph structure and assigned uh, them a choice of three topics. They could do cause and effect about the Seoul, sinking or the resort uh, roof collapse was another one, and I forget the third one, but I gave them three choices of social issues, tragedies that had happened, and they were required to write a paragraph about causes and effect for those. So started with the textbook and then did classroom discussion, and then their um, exam was you know, applying that idea to different topics. Sounds good. Do you have a course website or anything? I don't. I'm not as much into the tech stuff as I should be, but I'm looking into, I don't know what the easiest way to do a course website is, if it's through Google, but yeah, I'd like that to. sounds like a great idea for a whole future show. <laughs> <laughs> yes, walk I me through Google it. Google Sites. Yeah, Google Sites. It's too bad, because it could be so much more robust and friendly, and it's not. I have my, uh, my my call students, I have them use the Google sites just because we're using other Google properties, but I can't stand it myself. I, I mean, I'll, I'll use WordPress before Google sites. I use Blogger for most of mine because it's already tied into my Google. You can have as many as you want. It's um, Daniel, I see you mentioning uh, Socrative in the chat room, uh, and that's come across my radar as well. What what do you think? I it, As I said in the... Uh, in the chat, I, I, students have been really impressed by it, both in terms of the students in my classes as well as those preparing you, to use it as teachers. Can you give us the 411 on it? What, what is it? Yeah, Socrative is a, um, I mean, a, it, it's kind of tough to define it, but you, it could be used as, as a quiz platform as well. But essentially, it's a, uh, it's a kind of electric, electronic clicker system. Um, and that is, you can put up a question really fast. Uh, you don't even have to write the question in. You could just tell the students, choose A, B, C, or D, and you can write the answers on the board. 
and they can take their phones, go to a, a room in Socrative, and register their vote. You could have that up on your projector, and uh, they could see the votes coming in real time and see them uh, see the kind of polling in that way. Um, you can use it in a few different ways, like I said. That's one way you could just give a simple question very quick, um, and it's a way to get the temperature of the classroom. The, uh, another way is you can actually use it as uh, predetermined quizzes. You can make quizzes and save them and assign them at particular times. Uh, students can go in and, and get graded on those as well. So it, it's, a, it's kind of flexible. It's, um, I, it, was, uh, it was in real flux up until about a year ago. I think it's stabilized a lot since then. And my feeling about smartphones is it's so much part of our students' lives. It's so much part of our lives. It's like whenever you can use that force for good, you know, use the force. <laughs> it's there. It's, the energy's around it. And well, if you the can... nice thing about this was is that they could just go in and do that, and mm -hmm. uh, right away another student could take their phone, to, could borrow their partner's phone if they needed to, and and, and do it right after them. Mm -hmm. So, because I did have that, I, I have some. Uh, I had some international students who didn't have a smartphone. I had some students who didn't have data access in the classroom because our Wi-Fi is terrible. Um, and so, you know, it's it's really flexible in that way. Now, for me personally, I wouldn't use it to do any graded assignments because because of that fact. I can't rely on data connection. I can't rely on their phones. So, so is there any way that you can export the whole the whole result to yeah. Evernote or anything? Yeah, you you can um, you can download and export, or you can email it to yourself. I, I don't know what other features they have now. I. I'd be surprised if they did haven't integrated with Google Docs yet. I haven't used it for about six months. And, and Nina, who just confessed that she does not have a smartphone, chimed <laughs> in with a really nice low-tech way of like, I mean, that immediate feedback is kind of awesome. And uh, just giving them like A, B, C, or D cards who work sometimes if you want to poll the students for, you know. Um, and also I find like checking for understanding. There's all sorts of th you know ways you can check for understanding in a way that they will respond much more accurately than, you know, saying, Okay, you understand? Everybody understand? Okay. Um, Sunny, uh, tell us what you're going to be focused on this semester and what's on your plate. I know you have some mm -hmm. burning questions you're curious about. Uh, um, other than my projects, I will be a TA, right? So the course. Oh, TA, but also your projects. Feel free to share. Oh, my you're project. Uh, it's yeah. kind of there's uh, some parts overlaps as well because nowadays in a Korean K-12 um, education want to bring more um, tech side of um, um, okay, smart education. I don't know what exactly that describes. But anyway, like it's something to do with uh, um, technology stuff, such as a smartphone. It could be smartphone, but the biggest change is using digital textbook. And I'm sorry to interrupt yeah. you, Sunny, but we just have mm -hmm. late breaking news that we've used up most of Lauren's data for August. <laughs> and she's going to be leaving us soon. Uh, if you're still there, Lauren, do you have any final words? She's gone already, and I hope we didn't ruin your data plan. Aww. Sorry. <laughs> Please continue, Sunny. Bye-bye, Lauren. Bye, Lauren. Thank you very much for joining us, Lauren. <laughs> okay, yeah, it's it's about uh, how to use digital devices in classroom. And the biggest change is that um, education report want to impl implement it in a K-12 education system. It's a digital textbook. It's because they could have interactive devices in it. For example, if they don't understand certain parts, students can post a question and teacher can give a feedback on it. But the thing is, we don't really have um, um, experience how to use this digital textbook in class. So in university level, we should prepare pre-service teachers, know what exactly going on with the digital textbook and then how to implement in a classroom. So at the end of semester, they have to do the micro-teaching demonstration as a course requirement. So um, we, are, um, we are going to ask the students to uh, come up with a certain lesson using digital textbook and, and electronic devices such as a smartphone or iPad or something like that. So that is what we're going to do. But to be honest, I am not familiar with those stuff yet. So. Um, and when, when last we spoke, you were focusing on doing a research within the context of a flipped classroom. 
and mm-hmm. looking for something to measure or looking for what the research question would be. Uh, have mm-hmm. you found that yet? Mm. Uh, there are a lot of, um, since I'm working with the documentary team right now, like there are so many different aspects they want to looking at, you know, by doing the flipped classroom because the main thing in a cla- flipped classroom is removing teaching to the outside of classroom and then within that um, context students are centered and then we see how they're gonna um, organizing their own learning right so we're gonna give a big like one research question is really so could it be happen if we moving that um, teaching part to the outside of classroom and, so, and by soul can, can you tell us what you mean by soul oh self uh, soul is S O L E self organizing an uh, organized learning environment. So people have a tendency to learn by themselves. So what they're gonna do is basically they're gonna give a um, computer monitor or device within a four people or five people, just one device. So we're gonna give a big question to the student. So we're gonna find out how wisely and creatively and critically they can find the answers from the given um, device or access to the internet. Okay. So that's what you're, you're going to be the Sugata Mitra of Korea. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> we will see. <laughs> um, Dan, as someone who has and is experimenting with flipped classrooms, uh, any thoughts on that in general or research yeah. ideas? Well, actually, I, I mean, I'm writing up my my study now, so <laughs> yeah. that, that that's part of uh, that's part of what I've been looking into myself. And first, let me note that uh, I, um, if anyone's interested, the KMAL conference, K A M A L L, that's in three weeks, I believe it is, um, is going to be focusing on on um, uh, oh, geez, what was the title? Um, um, <laughs> Sorry, independent learning or uh, something mm-hmm. of that sort, and uh, so definitely right up this alley. I, I, I think I think you'll enjoy it, and I'm gonna I'm gonna present my uh, my project there. Um, but in, in terms of what to research, it, it really technology like for self-directed language learning. Thank you. You're so good. Um, See, that's what Google is good for, isn't it? Language-directed <laughs> 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 learning. You said. And I want to say hello to Brian. Thank you for joining us, Brian. Hey, Thanks. Brian. Long time no see. Yeah, I have to check the volume here, but yes, good to see you again, good. Daniel. Uh, so, in, you know, in terms of kind of uh, the research side of, of the flipped classroom, it's really interesting because, um, you know, it, it's conceptually it's really not anything new. It's more of technologically mm-hmm. new uh, in, in many ways, and. It's it's more of something that's logistically come into age. Uh, you know, it's it's just a twist on the old give homework and or, or give a reading and take it back to the classroom. But now this is allowing the teacher to uh, more project themselves as they would in the classroom outside of the classroom, which you know that was possible to do with a written uh, with some kind of writing that students would take home and read but it wasn't something that everyone could do and it was certainly not easy uh, and so in, in terms of the research aspect of this you're mostly looking at methods inside the classroom of, of types of student engagement and types of students who are able to uh, kind of take control of their learning outside of the classroom as is really needed with flipped a flipped classroom so for example, in my classes, um, you know, just because you build it doesn't mean they'll come. And so you have to determine who is using it, how they're using it, and how you can uh, help them to use it better in that regard. And so a, a couple of parts of the flipped classroom that are pretty essential are the some kind of outside video recording where you're mm-hmm. presenting content, presenting information and some form of assessment that's saying that the students somewhat understand what you've given them. Right? And in both of those cases, the, uh, the, the videos in my case were, were, were viewed most of the time, but the, um, uh, but the quizzes were, God, they, they did not do those quizzes. <laughs> so uh, 
So I, I think there's a lot of different ways that you can look at that, uh, but mostly you're looking at methods. Mm -hmm. uh, Brian, you've been, I don't know how long you've been tuning in, but do you have any, first can you tell us who you are, uh, where you're teaching, and any thoughts on anything you've heard or have about the coming semester? Sure. I've, uh, I'm a teacher at Dongsa. Conversational English is what I mostly do there. Uh, one thing that I'm doing differently this year, our university has an English cafe with outside activities, uh, games, but also some of the outside activities this time, uh, I'm the manager, uh, will be uh, fitted to the textbooks. So there's a unit on tasting in the textbook. We'll have a taste and textures option at the English cafe. So I'm trying to get more of my students involved outside of class in... Uh, I don't know, real-world activities, but uh, more than class activities. Do you have any online presence for this? I, we have a blog for our class, uh, for the uh, cafe. I'm going to keep it private for now. Because that's one of the things that I would, uh, this is on my agenda for this semester, is I, my final exam last semester was uh, Google Hangouts on air. Uh, and so mm -hmm. I, I, and no one had to do it publicly, but um, they were invited to do it publicly. And they could kind of choose the topic, and they, just like we're doing now, presented, um, uh, they had a 10 to 15 minute segment, they could do it alone or with a partner, and they were streaming it live, and we had wonderful people in the chat room tuning in, and I just love that. I just love that they're using their English to, to connect globally, and so I, I would love to find ways to almost have them specialize throughout the semester on something that they really want to talk about and, and, and have them focus on the vocabulary and the situations where they're most likely to be using this English and to kind of develop that and to share that and to broaden those conversations. So. <laughs> it sounds a little vague because I haven't totally gotten the syllabus ready for Monday, but uh, that's what I'll be thinking about this weekend. I would like to do that too, but I just find the students aren't as motivated. Even for the things they want to do, they don't necessarily want to do them in English. For my students, anyway. <laughs> it's a mandatory but non-major class, so I don't know that... Uh, mm. They're excited about putting the extra time in. Yeah, I totally agree. Plus, you know, something that uh, people often don't talk about is the fact that these students are taking a lot of class, you know, class hours. Uh, I, I think my, I think a lot of my students are taking what, like, 20, 21 hours of class. Yeah. But ours are the most fun. They should want to do extra stuff for us. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Exactly. We, we all want to think we're the best. <laughs> so we're coming up to the top of the hour, and I, I want to be respectful of people's times, uh, so we should probably start thinking about wrapping up. Uh, so this has been great, and it's been good for getting me out of vacation mode and into, okay, I'm going to be in that classroom in a few days. Um, but any closing thoughts, anything we haven't touched on that you'd like to share or other comments? I, I just probably say good luck to everybody. <laughs> good luck and be safe out there. Uh, <laughs> I watch Hill Street Blues. I get it. <laughs> Thank you. I, 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 we're, we're dating ourselves. <laughs> um, I'm I'm glad I could have joined um, um, this conversation tonight. It was fun and. Even if I don't, even though I don't teach any class in university level, uh, but I learn a lot of um, apps and, and teaching tips for the first weeks. So I would say thank you very much, and I'm looking forward to having another chat soon. Yeah, is the next chat Tuesday at nine? Yes. You know, one of the things I would like to do this semester is keep this going. I've I've wanted to, you know, I've, I've done EdTech Talk for years and it's been uh, uh, a good way of kind of keeping my batteries charged but uh, you know connecting with people who are doing what 
I'm doing and confronting the same challenges and that experiencing the same uh, things uh, is a great way to to stay professionally uh, uh, engaged. And so I would like to keep this going. I think uh, our next show will be Tuesday at 9 p.m. Korean time. That is 1200 GMT. So it'll be in the morning in uh, the Americas and midday in the Europe and Africa. Um, and I don't know, we don't have a topic yet. If anyone has suggestions for that show, please share them in our chat room or on the post for this. Um, and if people would like to have a show that's not just about ELT in Korea, uh, I'd love to help facilitate that. People can, it's very easy with a Google Hangout to do this on your own. Um, I'd love to do a, a Korea elementary version or secondary. Uh, so hopefully this is... Uh, just a start of things to come. Uh, thank you very much to those who've joined us in the Hangout, those who've participated in the text chat and who have tuned in. And uh, we welcome all your, your feedback and ideas and hope everybody has a great semester. And before I go, uh, I just posted a link on a group chat Hangout just now. It's a, um, about an event of John Bergman, who is the initiator and pioneer of a flipped classroom. So he's coming to Korea. Either Busan or in Seoul, you can um, attend the conference or symposium if you want. It's a free event, so you can come to see or listen yeah, to him. Very interesting. Thank you. I'm glad you posted that. He's, a, uh, he, he's the one who started off in Colorado, right? Yes, yes, he's and the one. Now, yeah. And now he's the tech specialist in Chicago. Uh-huh, yeah. yeah. And I'm sorry, this is on, what, September? 15th? September 15th for the Busan and the 19th for the Seoul. Oh, it's always so exciting when big things happen here in Busan. You capital <laughs> city people get all the action. Oh, very <laughs> exciting. Thank you for sharing that, Sunny. Yeah. All right, well, thanks again, everybody. Uh, I really appreciate it. I hope you have a great uh, week, and uh, everyone's welcome back on Tuesday. Sure. See you Thank then. Thank you for inviting. Bye. Bye. Thanks, Jeff. Bye-bye. Thank you.